Hello, everybody. Live here on Facebook. I'm Michelle Edmonds with Idaho News 6. So good to be with you again for making the grade. Yes, even for the past years, we've had to do this remotely. We have brought you the best education news across the state when it's probably been the most important to you as parents, as educators, as administrators, and even as students. So joining me to talk all things education once again is Kevin Richard from Idaho Education News. Hi, Kevin. Hi, Michelle. How are you doing? I'm good. I think a lot of parents are breathing a slight sigh of relief as so many school districts across the state, uh, number one, are talking about going back to in-person learning in a more consistent form, but also two, they're able to talk that way because coronavirus cases, the numbers are down. And what it has been what we've been looking for as I said, for almost the past year now. So let's dive into in-person learning. Sure. I know that Idaho Education News has done a great job of kind of trying to keep up with what every school district is doing, and it differs across the board. So if your child is about ready to enter into some sort of different form of learning, we'd love to hear what they're doing, what you're thinking about it, what the policies and procedures are gonna be. And again, it is at the local level here, Kevin. Right, and it really does vary from district to district. As you said, uh, West Ada has put together a plan that they hope to put into place by the end of March to uh, to move closer to in-person learning. Boise is still discussing its uh, reopening plans. Uh, that conversation is gonna continue this week. I believe they have a meeting on Thursday, if I'm remembering all of our school board meetings that we're keeping an eye on. Uh, Napa school board is meeting tonight to discuss their options. So you are starting to see these are the three biggest districts in the state uh, talking about what would it take to get uh, kids back into school for at least the final uh, couple of months of the school year? When you've been watching, as you said, all of you over at Idaho Education News, the school board meetings, has there been any interesting takeaway with, it maybe in terms of case numbers and what school districts are deciding, or in terms of student numbers? and what is decided, are there any links or are these really, as I said, local decisions? They really are local decisions. And, and Michelle, one of the things that really kind of jumps out at me as we've covered this issue the past few days is that yes, the case numbers are a big part of the equation. Yes, the vaccinations are a big part of the equation. And we can talk about both as we, as we go here, but a big part of the equation that maybe we don't spend as much time paying attention to that our Sammy Edge did a really nice job of reporting on earlier this week is the staffing issues. And it's not just teacher staff issues, it's staffing the cafeterias, it's staffing the bus routes, it's getting the employees, the support staff back into schools so that you can have a fully functioning school. And one of the things that's really interesting about this, uh, about this story is that the districts are really struggling to fill these positions, partly because uh, employees are finding that they can, you know, maybe make more uh, working at a Costco or working for an Amazon center. So, you know, these districts are, are struggling to fill these positions. And, you know, Sammy's story really focuses in on Nampa and trying to you know, staff the cafeterias. And it's really kind of, uh, you know, an all hands on deck kind of situation, you know, folks uh, stepping into to help out, uh, you know, staffers helping in, uh, stepping in, uh, some parents are stepping in. Um, you know, it, it's really going to be a complicated issue, and it's going to be uh, something that West Ada is going to have to deal with if if they move closer to reopening, as they plan to move closer to reopening. It's something Boise is uh, dealing with, and it's not something you pay as much attention to, but it is very definitely part of providing in an all-encompassing educational experience. I do have to give a shout out. We're looking at the document right here, the story by Sammy Edge, because I found this to be, honestly, Kevin, one of the most insightful pieces that we have seen over the last couple of months, because we, meaning we as journalists, or perhaps we as parents, forget that there is a whole microcosm that goes into running a school district. and you have to have all of the working pieces and parts. And I really had a takeaway when hearing from the Nampa School District during this piece that it's not 
about necessarily case numbers. If they can't provide meals for students and they are required to under federal law and they don't literally have kitchen staff to do it, they can't choose to reopen. So there is a much bigger story to be told here. And I, and I really appreciated this piece. And go back to what we learned last spring about the social function of our public schools, not just the educational function. We, we understand that. And that's a huge part of the story. But the social function of public schools is something that you can't overestimate. I mean, for a lot of students, the school lunch, you know, the school lunch program is their their most balanced and most, you know, complete meal of the day. It's really important to these these students. And we saw that last spring, you know, districts really trying to figure out ways to get lunches to students who are home during the pandemic. Well, now you're seeing the other side of that issue, trying to make sure that you can have a functioning lunch lunch program as you bring kids back into school more. So, you know, it's something we don't pay nearly enough attention to. And, and I think as, as reporters, as journalists, as, as people who watch the education system, I think that's been a real lesson this past year. So I thought, I thought Sammy Edge's story uh, really put a spotlight on something that we, we don't, we can't overlook. Well, and you talk about school bus drivers mm -hmm. or school nurses. So if those people are not in place, what are school boards going to do in terms of a reopening plan? I mean, Boise is facing this as well. Boise is facing it. They, they handled it a little bit differently. So their situation might play out differently. They, they furloughed a lot of these staff members and kept them on benefits. So the hope is that these students, uh, students, uh, the hope is that these staffers are going to be ready to, to come back, uh, that they're eager to come back in their position to come back. So we'll see how it works out in Boise, but Boise still hasn't decided exactly what they're going to do in terms of in-person learning uh, or trying to expand in-person learning for the remainder of the school year. I want to bring in Jana's comment here, Kevin, because this is interesting. She's saying increase sub substitute pay during the pandemic. That's what many districts in neighboring states have done. She says, stop reinventing the wheel. Use the relief funds for this. And I assume she means the COVID-19 federal dollars that are coming through the state. I, I, and some I really districts have already been doing this, by the way. Some districts have been trying to uh, raise substitute pay for exactly the point Jan is making. That they're they're hard to find right now. But what's interesting too, and this goes back to to Sammy's story from Monday, that part of the inducement now for getting substitute teachers is that if you're signed on as a substitute teacher, you've got access to the vaccines. And you know, for a lot of folks who are waiting and hoping to get their turn for a vaccine, that's a, that's a pretty powerful incentive right now. I hadn't even thought about that. No, and that's another angle of the story. There, there are just a lot of dimensions to the piece. So, you know, we've talked about it. It's on our site. It was published on Monday. So you have to scroll down just a little bit on the, the website, but it's it's worth your while to find. Gretchen's also making the comment. She says Valley View raised sub pay yep. in the Valley View School District. Valley View also hasn't made a full decision to come back to in-person learning either. So it's fascinating. And, and, and those that we're watching, we're trying to keep an eye on all of these uh, large districts as they uh, try to navigate what to do here the rest of the school year. Let's talk about K-12 cases because yes, this plays a role. I mean, fact of the matter is, is that Kevin, this is awesome news. K-12 caseload is way down, and this is what we've been waiting for. It's it's more than just flattening the curve. It, it's a real dip into what is happening with inside the schools. If you look not just at this week's numbers, and this week's numbers, you know, if you look at the bar graph, you know, there it is. It's That's the lowest number we've seen since the first report that the state did way back in the first week of October. Now, it's a little bit shorter reporting period, so I, I want to kind of leave that as an asterisk. The state issued this report on Friday. They usually issue the report on Monday. So you're not picking up any case numbers that might have been reported over the weekend. So it's a little bit shorter window. But even at that, this is a very low case number. And if you look at just the past few weeks, really, since school went back in in early January, the numbers have been pretty consistent. And, and they've been a lot lower than we saw in November and December. And that's exactly what you want to see as you're trying to get more kids back into school and you know, you hope that this trend continues and you hope, you know, you know, it's where we are right now 
as a country is you hope that the vaccinations do their thing and get us ahead of the variants that might come along that might be more contagious and more dangerous even than what we've seen with the the coronavirus so far. So you've got that kind of race against time. But right now, the numbers are encouraging. There's no question about that. I would rather be talking about that than things we've shown in the past. Most of them. Uh, you know, yes, I'd rather have us, you know, with a bar chart showing 87 cases as opposed to 500 cases, which is what we saw really not that long ago. I mean, that was, you know, that was back late fall. And you, you know, you see that spike and that spike continued, you know, right leading into Thanksgiving and picked up right after Thanksgiving. So, you know, a, a big drop off and, and a sustained drop off, like I'm saying, it's not a one week blip. So even though we're talking about a shorter reporting period, we're seeing some sustained leveling off of those cases. And that's what we're seeing with overall cases, you know, with the overall new case numbers, uh, we're seeing a drop off to where those numbers are back to where they were in the fall. All encouraging news. You, you just you hope it holds out. You hope the vaccinations uh, start to kick in and start to have an impact. You know, and you know, hope we get into the spring and beyond, and, and get on the other side of this, in spite of you know the, the cloud of how the variants might affect uh, case numbers in the schools, case numbers in the general population. Kevin, let me bring in Eric's comment here because it goes back to what we were talking about with staffing in schools. He's asking. Why are we just looking at hiring or finding staff now? This should have been considered months ago. And there are many, I think, levels to this question. Obviously, we're talking about whether or not you had a number of students in school to even provide lunches to and whether or not they needed that kind of staff number in the kitchen or in the nursing office or on the bus routes or whatever it may be. But also, Kevin, what happens, and I'll play off Eric's question here a little bit, with schools that were already overcrowded and they knew that going into this school year, but maybe didn't hire because they knew they were gonna be in a hybrid model and didn't necessarily have to have huge numbers in the classrooms because they divided the school in half by keeping some students mm -hmm. at home and some students at the school. What, what happens now if we start talking about bringing all of those kids back? Do we have overcrowded schools to the point that it's going to break teachers' backs. It, it really is complicated, and that whole social distancing issue is something I know Boise is wrestling with, with how to how to maintain social distancing, or to what extent can you maintain social distancing? It's it's difficult. I mean, keeping kids six feet apart in a classroom that's a complicated uh, calculation to try to work out, especially you know. And you talk about some of these sc schools that are crowded under normal circumstances. West Ada is kind of a you know a case study in school crowding issues. So, you know, it's it's going to be very complicated. You know, staffing, social distancing, you know, it's it's not going to be easy. So, you know, I think it's something district officials, trustees have been wrestling with for months. We didn't just get to this point uh, you know, just in the past couple of weeks. I mean, this has been an ongoing process and that's kind of what I wrote about last week, kind of taking more of a step back and looking at how we got to this point. Well, and districts aren't the only people talking about in-person learning. Let's head over to the Capitol, where there are a number of bills going through the legislature right now regarding in-person learning. Uh, where do you want to start with these? Because they're coming from all angles, whether it be the state superintendent presenting her own bill or some coming out of the legislature themselves. What's the generic thought behind these bills? Is it a power control issue? Yes, and I think it's also a... And I think it's also a desire to set the default of in-person learning. I, that's definitely what uh, Superintendent Navarra is trying to do with her bill. She brought in a new version of the bill. It got introduced in committee on Monday. That's different than a week ago when she brought a similar bill and it didn't get printed. It was voted down unanimously. So a new bill, it's been introduced. We'll see where it goes in the pipeline. What what Superintendent Barra wants to do is to kind of set the ground, you know, ground grounding here that barring an unusual circumstance, the default is to have the schools open. Now, you talked about uh, other pieces of legislation regarding public schools and higher education. Both of those bills have passed the House. Uh, you know, House members passed uh, bills written by by their own 
uh, by House members to address this issue. And really with the K-12 issue, with the K-12 bill, the crux of the matter is that uh, the lawmakers want to make sure that those decisions about school opening are being made by school officials. You know, there is a function where, where the State Board of Education or the governor can be involved, but the goal here is to make sure that the educators are playing the lead role in reopening decisions as opposed to the public health districts, which is kind of what's been happening the past several months. But I think it does reinforce where legislators want this decision to be made. I was going to say, isn't that exactly where we've been? I know, I know early on in the pandemic, there was a lot of confusion about who had control over opening or closing schools without a doubt. And the State Board of Education is why they had to ultimately step in back at the end of March, beginning of April to make those decisions. But since then, that hasn't been the case, I don't believe. Since then, the state board has really tried to step back and the governor's office has really tried to step back and say, we want these decisions being made locally and we want these decisions being made by the school boards, by the, by the school officials. And that's been what's happening. That's why we're talking about how it looks so different in West Ada as opposed to Boise, as opposed to Napa. Well, all these decisions are being made by local school boards. What, why don't we um, jump to when we're talking about college campuses too. I want to uh, talk about cases on college campuses because we didn't touch on that. And I know yeah. that Kevin, you've been doing such a good job of following how the college coronavirus case numbers have been doing as well. Uh, again, flat, I think is where we stand for this past week. Flat, very little change in terms of the case numbers. And that's encouraging news on the campuses. And what's really encouraging when I look at the Boise State numbers and the University of Idaho numbers, you look at these uh, these positive test rates, 2.1% uh, at Boise State University. It's even lower at University of Idaho. It's, it, it's, you know, it, it's about 1% or slightly above 1%. That is way below the statewide average. And, and health officials are really watching that positive test rate because it gives you a sense of just how widespread the virus might be in a community or in this case on a campus. So if you're if you're getting one or two percent, only one or two percent positive test results, that tells you from a health, from a public health perspective that right now it appears that the virus is fairly well in control on these campuses. So these numbers are, are like I said, the numbers are flat and they've been fairly flat across most of the campuses. You know, a couple of campuses, uh, Lewis Clark for the past couple of weeks, reporting no new cases whatsoever, no active cases. Some campuses reporting maybe one or two or three cases. So again, pretty encouraging news right now as the colleges and universities try to navigate the rest of their spring semester. It'll be fascinating as we move well past this pandemic to see what comes out of the college campuses in terms of what you know they're doing their own research. They're doing their own studies on how well they're doing or not doing in controlling a pandemic inside the environment that they can control. I just think that there's so much learning and processing that we're going to learn from this pandemic coming out of our college campuses and what they've done and what's worked. Right, I think that it's, it's not just the health perspective of what we've learned about trying to keep a campus safe and trying to keep students healthy and staff healthy in the middle of a pandemic. It's also what are we learning in terms of the, the education delivery model? What sort of experiments, what sort of innovations, what sort of force changes uh, outside of the pandemic? What, what do we continue to do? And that's, uh, you know, that's something we're going to be looking at closely. It's part of the enrollment project and the higher education project that we're going to be working on in the next few months is looking at, well, what do colleges and universities have to do just to get through the pandemic? That actually turned out to be a good idea. That actually seems to do something beyond the pandemic to help, uh, help students and help uh, colleges and universities reach out to students. And push education forward. So right, exactly. I mean, we, we, we know, that colleges and universities need to do something more, something different. You know, they need to innovate to reach out to students who are right now uh, not really looking at college. Let's stay on Boise State's campus, sure. shall we? Because that, I say stay on campus, but let me just take you down the street a little bit to the Capitol as well, mm -hmm. because 
that short distance right there is causing some pretty big rifts during this legislative session. You and I talked about it before. The university presidents during education week made their presentations to JFAC, the budget committee, about what they needed to continue to make sure that they could provide quality education to students in the state of Idaho. But there was pushback and specifically pushback against Boise State and its president, Dr. Marlene Trump. Let's talk a little bit first, Kevin, and give some people some background on what's happened in the last week, that there is a proposition, uh, I'm not sure where it is in the legislature right now, is it an official bill that yep. could actually change the way funding happens for higher education in the state of Idaho? Right, so two developments last week. Uh, first of all, Marlene Trump sent a letter to legislative leaders, le legislative budget writers. It was a response to that that tense budget presentation that she had back in late January when she was presenting the Boise State University budget request. Um, questions were raised about several uh, social justice issues on campus. She wrote a response where you know, she tried to refute some of the claims that were made in the committee, um, but also talk about you know, what she's trying to do, what Boise State is trying to do to uh, encourage uh, free expression uh, on campus. And you can see, see the piece that I wrote about this uh, on Wednesday, and it links to uh, President Trump's letter, seven page letter that she sent to, uh, to the lead budget writers, to the, the co-chairs of the budget committee. Well, two days later on Friday, uh, the House State Affairs Committee considered a bill and introduced a bill. So it means that it's out there and could come back for a full hearing at a later date. This would split the college and university budgets into four pieces. So what it means is that if this were to pass, legislators would be able to vote on a Boise State University budget as opposed to a University of Idaho budget, Idaho State University, Lewis Clark State College. Right now, they vote on one bill. And they've had enough trouble <laughs> in the past in, in the House passing one higher education budget. This idea of splitting the budget into four has taken on some, uh, you know, it's taken on some weight in conservative circles. The Idaho Freedom Foundation pushed this idea a few months ago in a, in a paper that they wrote, uh, that they released. And now you're seeing uh, some conservative legislators taking up that issue. Uh, Priscilla Giddings, uh, lawmaker from White Bird is the one who is introducing this bill. We'll see what happens with the bill. We'll see if it gets a full hearing. We'll see what kind of, uh, yeah, blowback there's going to be over this proposal, not just from uh, President Trump and from Boise State, even just in the the short introductory hearing that we had on Friday morning. Uh, one legislator from Southeast Idaho from the Pocatello area said, look, I've already heard from Kevin Satterley, the president of Idaho State University, my hometown institution. He's concerned about this bill. So you could have the universities and the university leaders banding together saying that this is a bad idea in their view. So could be a lot of debate about this before it's all over. Do you expect the State Board of Education to weigh in? They could very well. You know, they've been in past sessions, the State Board has been a lot more active in terms of taking a an overt position for or against legislation. They haven't done that yet this session. So We'll watch and see what happens. There is precedent, obviously, for the state board to say, yeah, we support this bill or we oppose this bill. Um, again, another variable, another another factor that we'll be watching for. I would have to think that there are plenty of legislators thinking that this would just prolong the session. I mean, it's not just one bill then. It's not just one budget that you've got to figure out. It's now four. It so I can only... Question, and it also comes at a time where... Michelle, the college and university leaders have really talked about, let's work together. Let's try to find some ways to collaborate. Let's find some efficiencies. Let's find some cost savings across the system. Really trying to you know, break down some of the barriers between the institutions and really trying to break down some of the, the parochialism that we've seen over higher education in this state in the past. You know, it you don't have to go too far back into our state's history to where you had really bitter debates between the institutions and between legislators sticking up for their hometown institutions. I mean, higher education used to be a really, really polarized issue just 
in terms of the battle over funding. Now it's polarized over social justice issues and the politics of higher education in the state. But I think I, I think the university leaders and I think you know very possibly the state board is going to look at this and say this this splitting up the higher education budgets takes us back into a place where we were trying to get away from where the four institutions were battling over money. And right now that's very scarce money. We've, we've chronicled this over the past several years that uh, you know, the colleges and universities are not receiving as large a share of the state budget. They're having to rely more and more on tuition and fees. So the prospect of these four institutions battling over a very small, you know, a relatively small slice of the budget pie, I don't think that's going to set well with the university leaders, and I'm not sure it would set well with the state board either. We'll see if the state board steps in on this one. Before I let you go, Kevin, let's discuss one more bill that has started to make its way through the legislature. And we're calling this the, I don't know, school negotiations labor bill. Uh, this is a bill that is talking about whether or not school districts, school boards, in fact, at the K-12 level, would have the ability to make their own decisions when it comes to negotiating with teachers unions. And tell us where this came from and where it's going. Well, where it came from is a little bit of a sketchy uh, proposition. Dorothy Moon, the legislator from Stanley, who introduced the bill, said that she's heard some concerns. She didn't really go into a lot of concern uh, details about who's raised these concerns, who has reached out to her. But yes, what this would basically do is this would allow school districts to decide whether or not they want to negotiate with local labor unions. And again, you know, Here's a print hearing. Here's an introductory hearing. It's not a full hearing on the bill. You could already see where the uh, where the fault lines are going to develop here. Um, John McCrosty, who's a teacher, who's a Democrat from Garden City, a member of that House Education Committee when it came up, brought up Proposition One and brought up the uh, the referenda on uh, Tom Luna's education overhauls, the elections that we saw in 2012 and. You know, here again, if you want to think about a flashback to a really contentious time in education politics, think back to 2012, think back to the fights that uh, ensued over those three propositions, the one proposition in particular dealing with labor negotiations. This could be a, a nasty debate if this bill moves forward because it, it could raise a lot of, it could bring back a lot of you know, old, concerns and some you know, old battles over labor negotiations. So a long way to go on this piece of legislation, but if it gets uh, a full hearing, expect that to be a very contentious hearing. And again, we're only in the middle of February and the legislature is expected to go probably until, oh, I don't know, at least the end of March. At least yeah, I think the, old, the expectation is they'll be there until the end of March. Um, you know, it's starting to take shape. The session is starting to, uh, to take some form. We're seeing a lot more legislation, not just in the committees, but now on the House and Senate floors. We track that daily. So if you're wanting to know the latest on education legislation, check our website. We have a daily update that we update during the course of the day. So if you look at it in the morning, you may need to come back in the afternoon to see what happened uh, the latter part of the day. But uh, we're tracking a lot of bills in the House and the Senate. You have me hooked to my app because I love doing that. I love seeing what maybe you're covering in the House in the morning and then on the Senate side in the afternoon. And that's the case today. I mean, there are some there are some bills that are going to the Senate side. Uh, so it'll be fascinating to see if what we've even talked about right here has any relevance next week. And that's the pleasure in covering the legislature. Right. And, and just a case in point, you asked about uh, the school opening issues, uh, the school opening bills. The two bills that passed the House that I alluded to earlier, they're going to come up in the Senate Education Committee this afternoon. I'll be tracking that committee hearing. So we'll have the latest on what happens with those two bills. So again, it's an all day proposition between uh, Clark Corbin and I. We try to cover all of the committee hearings uh, that pertain to education and education policy. And there's a lot going on over there. 
as there always is, it seems, yeah, especially cool. in the education world. Kevin, thank you so much for being here for Making the Grade. Appreciate all the work that you and the folks at Idaho Education News are doing. Again, IdahoEdNews.org. We link to many of their stories at IdahoNews6.com. Stay safe, and we'll talk next week. Yes. Thank you, Michelle. Stay safe and have a good week.